Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where just a few weeks ago I was proud to be able to offer you uh, the opportunity to go and see the San Diego Comic Con screening of X-Men Days of Future Past, The Rogue Cut. I was able to give away 20 tickets. Uh, I hope that those of you, you that went had a great time. I hope Fox put together a great screening for you. Uh, and I was also uh, really happily surprised that Fox Home Entertainment sent me a Blu-ray of The Rogue Cut, which, as I tweeted last week, I was going to watch over the weekend. I actually ended up watching it uh, during the earlier part of this week, and then I would review it here on the show. So you can imagine my disappointment that I don't have very good things to say about the X-Men uh, Days of Future Past Rogue Cut. Uh, in fact, I think that that whole ad campaign was probably intentionally misleading uh, because it makes you feel that the rogue cut will have a whole lot of rogue in it, uh, which is unfortunately not the case. Uh, there's just one little small scene that's added on, uh, and then even there, I think many of our hopes had been, at least mine had been, that they would finally do justice to the character. That Anna Paquin, who excelled on True Blood on HBO for many seasons as a really spunky southerner, would finally be able to do rogue right. Uh, but instead, uh, while she had a fantastic costume and she certainly looked like Rogue, uh, she was right back to, you know, square one with the character in terms of how she and Brian Singer initially portrayed her. Uh, no backbone, always scared, uh, never able to take care of herself, always, you know, the damsel in distress, uh, which is not Rogue, uh, you know, by, by any degree. So it was really, really disappointing to see uh, in that regard. The other weird thing about it is that the changes to the film are so subtle and so far and few between while you're watching it that it gets a little bit distracting from enjoying the actual film, which, you know, is a great movie. X-Men Days of Future Past is a really well-made film, uh, but the, the what I, I wouldn't even call it the rogue cut. I'd say it's really like the Brian Singer self-indulgent cut, right? Like, uh, he's like, well, these are the scenes that I really wanted to have in there. Or, you know what? Actually, I would even go so far, because, you know, Brian Singer does a good job at the X-Men movies. So my guess is they're like, well, we wanted to have a rogue cut, but there isn't enough rogue material to really justify a second cut of the film. So let's just throw in everything that we shot, even though in the editing room, we all agreed that it didn't belong in the movie. That's really kind of how it plays. Uh, so if you really are someone who is like, I want to see everything you put on the table. And there are some interesting uh, additions. Uh, there's one big scene between uh, Hank McCoy and uh, Raven Darkholm, a.k.a. Nicholas Holt and Jennifer Lawrence, uh, which, uh, although I have to say, after having seen it, I'm like, yeah, I can see why you cut that film. I mean, cut that scene from the film. It really uh, slows down the storyline and, you know, kind of unnecessary complicates it, although I think it does add credence to everyone's theory that one of the three romances in the upcoming film will be Mystique and Beast. Uh, although I don't know why they keep pushing that. Uh, although, and also when I was watching this film for the, actually the third time when I saw this uh, Rogue cut, I was like, does Charles Xavier have a crush on Rogue or not? I can't figure it out. Uh, I thought he felt, over, felt uh, that she was just like his sister, and one of the big problems with Mystique and Charles and X-Men First Class was that she had a crush on him, but he wasn't interested in her. So I kind of couldn't understand that whole relationship. And I was a little bit on Mystique's side being like, whoa, Chuck, figure out how you feel, then call me. Although I guess he does, because even though, you know, as we all know from the end of the movie, Mystique goes on her own path, we've seen from the X-Men uh, Apocalypse coverage that she's back with the X-Men at the beginning of that movie. So who knows what happened, uh, but we'll see how the relationships are sorted out. Uh, with that film. There was also one line I really liked that I actually would have kept. It's the only thing that I probably would have kept in the movie. And that's an exchange between Charles Xavier and a soldier at that uh, demonstration of the Sentinels at the end of the movie. It's just a really small little aside, but I thought it was really uh, powerful and I think it spoke really well not just to the character of Charles Xavier but to the parallels of what uh, you know the mutant war and like a real war the real wars the humans have fought in actual life uh, but one of the I think comic book movies really work uh, when they are as close to reality and, and they integrate his history as best possible so I, I again I can't really recommend that you purchase this I guess you know what if you're curious scratch the itch you get both cuts when you make the uh, purchase you get the theatrical version and the rogue cut but 
don't have high hopes for the Rogue cut, and maybe you might want to even watch the original cut, the theatrical cut first, so it's fresher in your mind, because I had a very hard time discerning what was new and what wasn't. That's how subtle the additions were, except for that one scene between... Uh, you know, towards the end, it got a little bit more obvious. You know, obviously the addition of Rogue, uh, Myst the Mystique B scene, and that little thing with uh, Charles Xavier. But overall, I think, you know, this is, I have to say, most of the times when I see director's cuts or additional cuts, I'm like, you yeah, know, the studio knew what they were doing. I mean, I know there are some exceptions to that rule, and I'd be curious to know what your thoughts are on director's cut versus studio cuts down below. But overall, you know, these cuts usually are made for a reason, and it works out well. And that was a, that was a case where Fox did a great job guiding that film to completion and to being very successful. And to their, in their defense, a successful Blu-ray launch of the Rogue Cut uh, because it was a very good ad campaign, if, if, even if misleading. But Fox has another problem on the horizon, and that is The Revenant, uh, whose teaser trailer just uh, last week really blew a lot of us away. But The Hollywood Reporter ran an article yesterday about how this thing is imploding. Uh, and it's just fascinating to read, and I think the number one thing that comes away from the article is poor Leonardo DiCaprio. This guy, if it wasn't for bad luck when it came to Oscars, he wouldn't have no luck at all. Uh, so let's talk about what's going on with The Revenant. So everybody thought The Revenant was going great, right? I mean, like, kudos to the PR department there for keeping this under wraps. Uh, to a point, obviously, now it's been revealed that The, Re uh, the Revenant is having a horrible behind-the-scenes situation. Although it seems to be that the rumors behind-the-scenes in Hollywood were so great that, uh, uh, you know, um, Alejandro Inaritu was like, I have to address them. And that's why the Hollywood Reporter article came to light, because they're like, this is just getting too big, it's snowballing, and it's going to maybe end up hurting our movie beyond the point of, you know, you know uh, no return. So what exactly is happening? Well, The Revenant, you know, it's this little movie, uh, it's an Oscar, you know, it's a clear, strong Oscar contender. Uh, Inaritu is coming off of Birdman, which swept the Oscars, more on that in a moment. Uh, but it seems like a small little Oscar darling film, right? And one of the only thing we really knew about it is that not only does it star Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hardy, uh, but also that uh, they made the very, you know, bold decision to shoot only in natural light. Uh, and, you know, uh, up to this point, Inaritu had been going around saying, oh, you know, I really, I gave myself quite the, you know, task here. I'm, I'm, I, why do I punish myself? I'm such an overachiever. That was the way that we have been looking at it. Uh, but this is what's actually going on. So the film was supposed to shoot from September to March, but, so it was supposed to finish shooting in March. However, they're still shooting, and they will likely shoot through the end of August because they're having a number of problems. What are they? Well, if you speak to different people involved with the film, they're obviously going to give you different problems, some that make uh, Inaritu look good and some that make him look bad. So we'll kind of try and go through them methodically. So anyway, uh, you know, Inaritu has admitted that by shooting with natural daylight, there's only so many hours, like four or five hours in a day that you can shoot. So you really can't afford to make mistakes, and unfortunately this production has had some mistakes. And matching the light has been a really big problem. They've wasted sometimes whole days, you know, trying to get to a, you know, also the locations are very hard to access, so it's been very, very difficult uh, to make sure that everything goes accordingly. Uh, so that's been a problem. Also, it's been very cold, and apparently uh, it's been very difficult for the actors to shoot under those conditions, you know, from the stars to the extras, and also equipment has broken. It's so cold. Uh, but it's not cold enough, apparently, for snow. That's another problem that they're having, that snow is melting or, you know, it's so warm that the snow that they could potentially bring in uh, will not stay frozen. So currently, they're planning to go out now move the shoot to Argentina where they can find some snow. So, you know, I guess not only do you have to try and match the daylight, but now you're going to have to try and match the trees. Uh, so good luck getting, you know, th you know, these very different settings to match. And uh, Inaritu has gotten so upset with his producer for he feels wasting the time of the crew with, you know, wrong locations and bad setups that he actually got rid of his producer from Birdman. Uh, some say he was, th this man was thrown off the set. Inaritu says, oh, he just was given a different task to do, which is really code for thrown off set. And Mary Parent, you know, a, long t a very long-standing direct uh, producer, has been brought on to finish the film. Uh, now, the budget 
because of this has ballooned. It's currently at 95 million, but people are expecting it to go as high as 135 million, which is absolutely ridiculous for such a film. Uh, I mean, it would have to win a ton of Oscars to be profitable. And even then, you know, it's not in 3D, it's not in space. I mean, Avatar and Gravity had very high returns and were hard, strong Oscar contenders. Not big winners, though. Uh, you know, although Gravity, of course, uh, Koran walked away with an Oscar for that. I think deservedly so because you know, of the technical achievements that he made there. But still, they weren't the huge winners that maybe some people had initially expected when they you know, first hit theaters and their campaigns first got underway. But anyway, those were like sci-fi shiny movies that I think get a lot of people to the theater. This is like a small art house film made for a blockbuster budget. So good luck getting a return on this. Now, I think that some people, including Leonardo DiCaprio, which by the way, it's rumored has like no lines in the movie, would say, oh, it's totally worth it if Leo wins an Oscar. If this is a big Oscar contender. It's totally worth all this, you know, this being a huge disaster. Yet, I think that because Birdman did so well, because of the politics of Oscar, it's very unlikely that The Revenant is going to do well as the follow-up film. Sometimes there's back-to-back -back Oscar wins. It does happen. Uh, and sometimes, you know, there's, you know, I think more likely at least back-to-back -back Oscar nominations. But you have to remember that Birdman won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Cinematographer, same cinematographer here, by the way. Um, uh, but, uh, let's see here. Um, what else did it have there? Uh, and Best Original Screenplay. Uh, and Best Director, of course, for uh, Alejandro Inarritu. So that's huge. Uh, and then it had other nominations in uh, sound and acting, but it did not win those. But it won the really major awards, uh, outside of acting, obviously. So I can't see them, you know, reaping such uh, copious, uh, you know, accolades on uh, Inarritu's follow-up film. It just usually doesn't happen. Uh, now, the other thing is, that's making Inarritu look bad, is that he's being accused of doing a very poor job blocking the, sh the shoot, the, the different uh, shoots. For instance, they're saying, since we only have four to five hours a day, we want to make sure that we block it accordingly so when we get that right light, the natural light, we can just get the shots done. But they're saying we spend all morning blocking a certain shot, and then just when it comes time to shoot, just when our window of uh, you know natural light opens, Inarritu changes up the whole setup, uh, and we have to, you know, we just lose so much time and we're not as productive as we should be. Inarritu says in his defense, he's always looking for the best shot, he's always looking to make the best movie, and sometimes things change. But I think a really good director um, is a little bit less haphazard than that. Uh, and then also people are saying that he's abusive of his, crew, his, his extras and his crew, uh, that he's making them shoot in horrible conditions, that he's uh, subjecting the extras to painful uh, uh, you know, scenes. For instance, they're using this example of a, an extra who's totally naked being dragged across the, uh, the forest floor, and you know, the crew was saying he was in pain, he was hurt, and Inaritu is insisting that he checked on that individual, that he laid down plastic sheeting so that he wouldn't be hurt, uh, and it's just like a whole thing. So I think this is really interesting to see this take uh, shape. Uh, some people are comparing it to Heaven's Gate because of the similar situation where you have creative people, you know, running amok apparently with uh, after an Oscar win. Uh, but we'll see how things actually play out. I again, I feel the real loser here is Leonardo DiCaprio, who again just doesn't seem to be able to catch a break when it comes to Oscars. Uh, also, I think what's, this really does add credibility to the rumor that Tom Hardy had to drop out of Suicide Squad because of uh, the production running amok with The Revenant. It seemed like a sketchy excuse at the time. Uh, you know, it seemed like he just didn't want to be in that movie, but I think that this is really going to help Suicide Squad even more just to show that he really, you know, Tom Hardy really did want to uh, be in Suicide Squad in the role that eventually went to Joel Kinnaman, but he was stuck shooting The Revenant. So you can blame The Revenant for that too. All right, so that's the second story of the day, and I'm very curious if you think this film can overcome that. Uh, you know, both creatively and also uh, from a financial standpoint. Do you think The Revenant could ever turn a profit with that kind of a budget, not including advertising and not including the money that's going to be, have to be spent on the uh, awards campaign? And do you think Leonardo DiCaprio has any chance to stand out uh, with all that noise as well being generated from behind the scenes for the film? All right, so the third story of the day is that Logan's Run ain't dead, right? Uh, Logan's Run is something that has been trying to be remade countless times. Nicholas Winding Refn, Brian Singer, all have been attached to it. Ryan Gosling uh, as an actor. And it's a, a remake of a film from the 1970s. It's actually an okay film. I've actually seen it, I, I think I believe, in, in film school and one other time. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's very distinctly 70s sci-fi, right? So that's one of the more interesting things about it. You're like, this is so weird. But anyway... Uh, it tells a story about uh, a, a, an, um, a, 
a utopian future where everyone's young. And when you reach a certain age, you're you're killed, you're gotten rid of, because they, they don't feel that that person is a worthy contributor to society and should be allowed to continue, and there's only so much room. Uh, so there's an individual who's supposed to take care of those people, uh, you know, and, and dispose of them as they when the, everyone reaches a certain age, but he becomes uh, aware of the, you know, the true horrors of the situation, and as he approaches his own, uh, you know, sell-by date, uh, he starts to become obviously more sympathetic with those that are trying to rebel and not be killed. So the reason this is in the news again is that Warner Brothers has hired Simon Kinberg to take care of this film. And this is, uh, you know, not to write it, because Simon Kinberg's very busy these days, but to, uh, to write the story and the treatment for another screenwriter to tackle. And this just shows Simon Kinberg's growing power in Hollywood behind the scenes as a, a creative individual. And I'm curious as to when he's going to probably make the jump to directing, which I would think would be somewhat soon. So what's he working on? Well, he's a big guy over at uh, Fox with their Marvel properties. I actually got to interview him for X-Men Days of Future Past. Great guy. Uh, he's working on, of course, Apocalypse. He's worked on Deadpool. He's working on Fantastic Four. Rumor is he had to fix Fantastic Four when Josh Trank went off the rails. Why can't these studios keep their directors on the rails? Uh, but anyway, he's also become a big player over at Disney with their Star Wars properties, working on some of the spin-offs and also the Rebels TV show. So Simon Kinberg is a trusted name so far uh, in the comic book realm, and the studios are using him. And it's interesting because he didn't come from the comic book world, uh, but he's really been able to make a name for himself in that type of property uh, just through his movie work. And I think so far, with Simon Kinberg, so good. I'm actually looking forward to Fantastic Four. I haven't gotten a chance to review the last trailer, but I thought it was the best trailer yet. And I think I have the sneaking suspicion that movie might actually be pretty good. So I like Kinberg and I'm excited for him to branch out and to take on even more properties. And I also think what's interesting about him is he's working at so many different studios. Fox, Disney, Warner Brothers, usually producers, behind the scenes talent, pick a certain studio and largely stick there. But Kinberg is so prolific that he's able to bounce around and have so many projects going at once. So he's also probably, uh, you know, uh, pulling in uh, some pretty nice paychecks. Uh, now, if not nice individually, certainly nice as a group. All right, so I'm curious, what do you think of Simon Kenberg's work to date, uh, and how does Logan Run sound as a movie to you? They have all these teen uh, dystopian futures, or in this case, a utopian, which is revealed to be dystopian future kind of movie, and do you think there's room for Logan's run after Hunger Games? You know, that's supposed to be supposedly finishing up, uh, and Divergent is, you know, going to uh, you know come to a close eventually in the Maze, uh, the Maze Runner as well. So do you think Logan's run can pick up where those movies have left off? It also is another property with a male lead, uh, which are far and few, uh, far and few between the, in between these days, although it seems to be changing with Maze Runner and the Paper Towns film, which is hitting theaters on Friday, which I will review later today. So as for the viewer question, I have a really great one from BTT viewer Sabina Atodoresi, and Sabina says, question, hey Grace, I hope this time you'll answer my question, I am, uh, in the last uh, few movies, Disney explored the relationship uh, between siblings. Frozen explores the relationship between sisters, and Big Hero 6 explores the relationship between brothers. Do you think they could do a brother-sister relationship? Me and my brother are big fans of Disney, and we would like to see a movie exploring that kind of dynamic between a brother and a sister. It is so much different than a same-gender relationship between siblings, plus both the female and male viewers could relate with at least one character. I hope you'll answer my question. I'm almost a three-year viewer of your channels. Love you. Tons of emojis, she added on there. Uh, just like the upcoming movie I'm sure we'll have, the emoji movie that we discussed on Movie Minute yesterday. But then she says, sorry for my bad English, not my native language. Sabina, great job with the English. And then she says she found my channels through her brother. So your brother sounds pretty awesome to me, Sabina. But anyway, wonderful question. And I do think that it would be nice to see brothers and sisters explored more, not just in animation, but just in movies in general. Um, I think that Hollywood, uh, I, I really feel that it would be, imp it's important to uh, explore healthy, you know, sibling relationships. And here's why. That's the, this is the main reason I wanted to to, uh, answer your question today, Sabina. Because in the movies, they're usually like combative relationships. Uh, you know, siblings don't appreciate each other. There's lots of drama. Uh, you know, it's there's a stigma against hanging out together. And I think that has blood into society. I feel like siblings, for some reason, you know, parents even, uh, and society, uh, obviously, which parents are a part of, uh, but really, like, encourage siblings to make friends elsewhere, which I find weird because friends will come and go. Uh, I mean, ho hopefully, ideally not. But your sibling will be in your life forever because of that, you know, family connection. And hopefully, 
and it's in your best interest for that to be a good connection. And the reason I bring this up is that I have a sister, and when I was in school, you know, we weren't in the same grade, and we would still have lunch together, though, occasionally. And it was really something that people in the school remarked upon because it was so unusual. And uh, the teachers in particular were like, oh, that's so sweet that you guys are friends and you hang out together. How nice. And I, I always thought to myself, I was like, you know, we're not the only siblings in the school. Uh, why aren't they having lunch together? And I always made me feel kind of bad that that, you know, those siblings either weren't interested or were made to feel that they shouldn't, you know, uh, hang out together. And so I'm curious, you know, is that still kind of like a thing, you know, for those of you like in high school and middle school, is there still a stigma uh, of hanging out with your sibling? And if there is, you should ignore that. You should definitely hang out with your sibling. Uh, I love my sister. It's like one of the best relationships in my life. And, uh, and I, I, it's apparently Sabina and her brother have a similar wonderful relationship. And if you, you know, if just because you, it would be a shame for you to miss out on such something that could be such a great addition uh, to your life. Uh, you know, especially, you know, when, you know, you're feeling down or things aren't going your way, friends are so important. So to have that close bond not be something that you can benefit from because of social peer pressures would be ridiculous. So I really wanted to point that out today. Uh, and also to agree with Sabina that it would be nice to see a brother and sister relationship. I don't want to go too much in it. Uh, into it. I think we all know some of the weird paths that, you know, all sibling relationships, again, go down in the movies. Uh, but I just think that uh, to the, the credit of Big Hero 6 and Frozen, two movies I wasn't crazy about. I do really admire their focus on siblings. And it would be nice to see a really wonderful, positive, healthy brother-sister relationship uh, portrayed on the big screen. Not only in animation, but also in live action. So Sabina, thank you for your wonderful question. Say hi to your brother for me. Uh, and I, I'm so happy to hear that you guys are good friends. And also, uh, I would hope that you guys down below would share, uh, you know, maybe uh, your own relationships with your siblings, uh, if they're, you know, positive or not. Uh, you know, it would be interesting to hear what your experiences have been and are right now. All right, thank you so much. That's today's morning movie news. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please read down below what you think of today's top three stories and the viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow in any question set, you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.